Welcome to episode 25 of Pearls of the Interior Life. Today's topic is practical mysticism. On one hand, that may sound like a, a spiritual oxymoron like jumbo shrimp. And in one sense, it would be that. But in another sense, it is spot on. And more importantly, in that sense, it is something that we are all called to. Our big goal is happiness in this life and heaven in the next. To achieve this, we need to stay close to God throughout each day. But how do we do that while living in the real world with all of its challenges and distractions? Growing our interior life through Christian mental prayer is the answer. This podcast mines the riches of the greatest spiritual tradition on earth so we can grow in holiness together. I'm Steve Smith. Thank you for joining me for Pearls of the Interior Life. Thank you for tuning into this episode and for making this time for the Lord. Today, we want to look at how important it is to always be aware of the spiritual realities that underlie the day-to-day -day events and activities of our life. This is why we've started doing this weekly roundup on Fridays of looking at events in the world, but looking at them and through that spiritual lens, so-called, but looking at that greater spiritual reality beneath the surface. And we do this because it's so important to keep in the forefront of our mind that God is always acting through everything. And yes, St. Paul, with that powerful line that it is in God that we live and move and have our being. And so we need to always be turning our mind to God in, in all things and seeking him in all things. And so that's why our topic today is practical mysticism. Let's look at practical first, just to be on the same page. So practical, can something be put into practice, not just in the realm of theory? So is it achievable and effective? I'm going to have a theory that the world's perfect donut can be concocted with onions and cod liver oil. Well, it's achievable. I can certainly cook up a donut with onion and cod liver oil, but is it effective? Does it achieve the desired ends of the theory? Is it tasty and digestible? Probably not. Some theories are not even achievable. It's not something that we can do right now with, with what we have at hand. There are theories of how we may be able to enter into time travel. Not achievable with the technology that we have. They're pure theory. So is it something that can be put into practice to achieve the desired ends? Is it practical? Mysticism. There is no one definition of mysticism. It has uh, spanned a broad range of meanings since the third or fourth century to today. But you know, there's always that idea that quite simply it's entering into the mystery of God, those things that are beyond our complete knowing. Here's some relevant statements from Father Jordan Alman, though, that mysticism is an experiential intuitive knowledge of the divine. And that is not the result of extraordinary graces, but the normal development of perfection of that grace received by every Christian at baptism. The idea here being that it, it is personal, it's experiential of God. This leads us to a well-known statement by Father Karl Rahner that the devout Christian of the future will either be a mystic one who has experienced something, or he will cease to be anything at all. And the devout Christian of the future, that, that's now. This is the future that he was envisioning, the postmodern future, where Christianity is really pushed aside by scientism, modernism, and so on. And so these definitions go hand in hand of mysticism. And their main point is having that personal experience of God. There's often criticism of Father Rahner and, and that statement of his, or at least how it's interpreted, that it, it may cheapen mysticism. And there's a lot to that. Because uh, mysticism in the fullness of it certainly means that, that completeness of arriving along the mystical path to that point of mystical union of God. And you think of people receiving these deep, revelations, having ecstasies, and 
and so on, and where it is something completely beyond us. And here that fullness of mysticism is recognizing that God is so far beyond us that nothing in this present world can even begin to capture him. Even our language inhibits us. It gets in the way when we try to fit God into the words and the conceptions that we have with those words that we're, we're doing an injustice, we're doing violence to the whole concept of God and becoming one with him. Okay, that's the fullness of mysticism. But all of the great mystics, and even going back to those like Pseudo Dionysius and the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, have said to get to that point, first we enter into the mysteries of God, we enter into the life of Christ. That's the mystical path that leads us to that you know, complete perfection that, that we aspire to. All right, so practical mysticism. We're concerned here with entering into these mysteries. And this is where we're obviously being more than a bit sensational with the title. The real point here is in our spiritual life, in our interior life, how do we connect personally with God? And this idea of a practical mysticism, how do we remain very closely connected to spiritual realities during the course of the day. This is very much in our Christian tradition. St. Jose Maria Escriva will tell us that it is in those very physical, very material, very day-to-day -day activities that we sanctify ourselves. St. Teresa of Avila will say the mystical path, prayer, much of that is in the loving and the doing, growing in virtue, engaging the world, Let's look at one more general aspect of this, and then we'll get into specifics. But there's that well-known formula that Christ entered into our humanity, that we could enter into his divinity, or he shared in his, our humanity, so we could share in his divinity. Very true, very beautiful. How does that play out day to day in our life? What does that actually mean to us? How do we share in his divinity? And to be sure, there, there are many ways that this happens, and many of those are supernatural at their core. And tying back, for instance, to the supernatural graces infused in us at baptism, from the grace we continue to get through sacraments, but other aspects of it are quite practical. How does that grace become operative in us? How do we act on that? And this is, the point we're getting at of recognizing the spiritual realities that underlie everything that is happening around us so that we can see God and relate to him, not in some you know, completely blind and knowing way. We're giving our faculties of intellect and will for a reason, but we have to be able to see what the underlying truths are in the things that happen before us each day, and it's so easy when the world just gets rolling and moving and everything's coming at us, and not to think about this, minutes become hours, hours become days, days become weeks, we haven't really even thought about where is God in all of this? And with that then, where is God calling me to be in all of this? So our point here with our, our weekend roundups, our weekly roundups, I should say, are, are simply to remind us, just some examples, just to remind us to always be looking for God and what's happening around us. So let's take last Friday's roundup as an example where we were looking at, again, the coronavirus. I apologize, there's so much always reflecting back to that, and hopefully not for much longer. But the underlying truth that we are made for community, okay, fine. What does that mean? How do we engage that in our life? So that's that underlying spiritual reality that as we're reflecting on what and how we do and how we respond to the shutdowns and all of that, recognizing that there's a much broader way that we're connected to God and to one another. And that, for instance, could bring us back to that well-known scripture. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, and then what does that mean to us? 
you know, maybe we hear a few good homilies on it. We find some good reflections. Well, fine, but that's not the end where we, you know, we just check the box. Okay, mystery solved. As you know, that's meant to be the beginning. Now we just have some insight into what that scripture means, that it's telling us that Christ is, is mystically joined even to these events on earth. Well, great. Maybe that leads us then in even deeper, where we start to wonder to ourselves, well, what does that mean in my day to day? If Christ could you know, somehow mystically feel Saul persecuting people on earth, um, how is he experiencing my actions this day? And maybe we reflect on it from that perspective. And maybe the Lord reveals to us some things that we thought were, you know, really high points of the day, yeah, weren't so much. Maybe there are other things that we really didn't think much of at all. But to God, the, these were our high points. The, these were marvelous times of grace for us. Maybe that leads us to wonder what it even means at all for Christ to feel persecuted. He's in heaven. He's with our, our heavenly father. How can he be persecuted in heaven? How can his soul be consoled by us and what we do down here? Isn't he in perfect bliss in heaven? And maybe that leads us to uh, digging into St. Faustina's revelations on divine mercy. You know, who's to say, but this is when we're told the Spirit will lead us to all truth. And this is one of the ways that the Spirit guides us to all truth. Through the spiritual realities that underlie the ordinary stuff of our life, this is where mysticism spills over into everything. God's truth is much more a verb than a noun. So we're, when we bring these things to the Lord and we're aware of that underlying spiritual truth to things, we can see where God is in it and where he is calling us to be. If we're looking at the shutdown. What is God saying to me in all this? How am I supposed to respond to this? What are the things that you know, are maybe outside of my comfort zone that would not ordinarily be my response to situations, but where, where God is drawing me out, drawing me forward? to act in love, that second great commandment, to love neighbor itself. And so this is why we'll often be doing these weekly roundups on Friday. It, it's certainly not to pick apart any one issue, and on any one issue, it is certainly not you know, to hear my opinion on it, to the extent that I give any commentary or, or some jokes just to lighten the mood. That's all there is to it for some context or some lightness. It is mostly just to help all of us stay in that habit of looking deeper, looking below the surface. What is the spiritual reality? How is God moving in that? How is he calling out to me? And then we do keep entering deeper and deeper into God's mysteries of, of who he is. And the greatest saints that ever lived, they never exhausted plumbing the depths of God's mysteries. They <laughs> barely broke the surface. Thomas Aquinas, God gave him that just that littlest glimpse of how grand the true majesty of God is. And when St. Thomas saw that, he just stopped his work. He said his work compared to the truth of God was just so much straw. <laughs> this is the guy who wrote Summa Theologica, and it was so much straw compared to the reality of God. And so that brings us back to our definition, practical mysticism. Yes, the heights of mysticism, at least for us mere, mere mortals, mere human beings, is something that is so far beyond you know, just ordinary human events that it is just all of God. It is nothing that we can attain to ourselves. But the path to that, the path to that is through our everyday life finding Christ in that, connecting it to Christ, making Christ become real to us. That is why he became man, so he could share in our humanity, so that we could follow that path to his divinity. And so I, I hope that those weekly roundups, when we do them, I hope they'll be useful for you in that sense, to just again, just for those little reminders to us each week that whatever else the week may bring to us, that God is always there. He is always there in all of it. And 
through all of it, working it for our good because he, he loves you so very much. So thank you again for joining today and I look forward to being with you again.